everybody and welcome back to the Moshiks mainframe channel. This is Moshiks. And this year is the 50th anniversary of the landing of the first humans on Moon, which in effect uh, is the, from the point of view of the Moon, 50 years ago aliens uh, landed on it. That's how the Moon perceives it. So aliens landed on the Moon 50 years ago. And as you, I already have a previous video about it and in the previous video, I showed um, how Don Isles, one of the programmers of the guidance computer on the on the Apollo uh, rocket, both for the command module and for the LAM, for the lunar module, um, he has been carrying around for the last 50 years this obviously open source software, all the since it's federal software, the software on the guidance computer is by definition for, uh, open source. And you can see here Don Isles, and uh, he's carrying around with him this printout uh, on a 14, IBM 1403 printer of the lunar uh, landing computer software. And, uh, and as I showed in my previous video, I kind of love stuff like that. You know that I'm a, I'm a sucker for, uh, for old printouts. And um, and obviously this is all an IBM 1403 printer, so we know this was compiled on the uh, IBM S360. In the beginning, they had a uh, a, an, an, uh, a Honeywell computer uh, on which they compiled uh, the lunar uh, binaries, and then they moved to uh, Honeywell 1800, first uh, Honeywell 800, then Honeywell 1800. And then finally, the assembler was ported to the IBM S360, of which they had a bunch of at uh, NASA in Houston, Texas. And, uh, and so I've always been fascinated by this print. I've also been in contact with Don Owls, of which I'm highly uh, proud of, uh, to be in contact with such a the person who wrote the software that landed the, the spacecraft on the moon was just fascinating to me. And so I, as you saw in my previous video, I went and I bought the IBM 1403 font, which I've had for a while. And, um, and I recreated the source printout in uh, original 1403 print here, as you can see, on green bar. And I uh, used a bunch of uh, uh, tools for that, and I have a, the previous video shows how to get this done. But as you can see here, clearly this is uh, 1403. You can see it from the way the O looks and the way the zero looks, and uh, for me, mostly the T gives it away. That's the shape of the font of the IBM 1403 print chain. Now, obviously, the print chain of the 1403 would kind of have a wavy uh, pattern for each line because it was moving so fast that certain letters were always a little bit in a different position than others and uh, that was kind of also a giveaway of but that's very hard to recreate i wouldn't say impossible but hard to recreate well with a digital font for today but this is good enough for me and i like the green bar bar and i like the fact that we have the tractor holes here and i send all this to don isles uh, i had some email exchanges with him i send him the source code now um, the source code is nice looks good and I have it also printed out in a thick book um, which I carry with me to events and stuff uh, just because I also like to peruse the the soft uh, the source code here there's some amazing stuff in here they had the whole uh, actually had within 36 kilo words of 15 bit uh, words each um, they had uh, the whole operating system the whole uh, guidance uh, software as well as a virtual computer in it which would have uh, bigger uh, uh, directives or directives that would, like trigonometry, etc., that would be much easier to program in assembler. For the rest is all in simple assembler, as they call it basic assembler, but has nothing to do with the basic programming language itself. It's just, it's just assembler. But here and there you see also the instructions that come from, uh, uh, from that virtual computer inside the guidance computer. Amazing stuff. Uh, if you have a long flight or something somewhere, I would uh, you know print it out and, and read it on your iPad or whatever. Um, it's some very, very interesting code there. Some amazing stuff they, they did in 36 kilo words of memory. Words, that's not megabytes, that's certainly not gigabytes, just 36, kind of like 36 kilobytes, but uh, instead of 8-bit bytes, that 15 bits words. Uh, but other than that, uh, yeah, very, very little memory. And only two kilobytes of RAM, or kilowords of RAM. That's all. 
they only had two kilowatts of RAM. The rest, the 36 kilo, uh, kilowatts was ROM, so not, um, not memory that the programmer could change. That was the software, as you can see here, it was burned into the ROM. All right, so um, th this video here is about, um, this is the source code, but I also wanted to get a PDF with uh, with 14 IBM 1403 front found done for the assembly output, and they would say, well, how can I assemble um, this this stuff on today's uh, computers? Well, you can, because for a number of years now, there's been something called the virtual AGC, uh, virtual Apple guidance computer software, has been. On, uh, on GitHub, and um, there's also, let me see here, virtual AGC, if you search for it, there's a lot of information, uh, here it is. So uh, here you have a lot of information and uh, about all the software went in there, and part of that is also includes the assembler itself that is able to assemble the old, um, the old uh, AGC software into on a on a modern computer and still produce the the binary for the original AGC computer and then the virtual AGC software here also includes an emulator for the Apollo guidance computer so you can assemble here uh, using Linux and then the output of the assembler can be loaded directly on the uh, Apple, on the um, sorry, on the Apollo guidance computer, of which we have an emulator, and so I'm going to show today how to get this done. First thing I need to do, I, as you know, I bought the IBM 1403 font uh, from a guy called Kellum IBM 1403. I bought this font for ninety dollars, I believe. Yeah, it's something around ninety dollars. I bought it and I had to install it on my Linux machine. So, first of all, I'll show you how how I got this done. So I'm here on my um, on my Linux box, uh, uh, which is just a uh, an old IBM Dell with an uh, i7 processor, very very fast, and I only think bought uh, bought it for sixty five dollars. Um, and so after I downloaded the font, I, I went and downloaded and installed it here in this directory uh, slash user slash share slash font slash true type. And then I built a subdirectory called custom and to put it in here. It's a true type font. Once you did this, you just do um, you update the um, font cache with the FC dash cache command, and that's it. Now it's installed. All right. Then, um, so I guess we can make this smaller by the way uh, for my terminals on on uh, almost anywhere the font that I prefer to work on for my text based work on, on terminals is uh, where do I see it uh, here it's in console out of medium um, I like this font a lot I think it's by Google if I'm not mistaken uh, that's the font that you see here and uh, usually I work with a resolution of 12, uh, size 12, but for this video, I think 17 is appropriate, so you can all see it. Um, but I highly recommend this uh, font. And you can just install it with uh, apt install font in console, or I think fonts in console, and then asterisk, and it will go and install it. And uh, it's a great font for working uh, in text mode when you very visible, very easy to read. Please, uh, it's pleasing to the eye. So, um, <clears throat> so I can remove that. Um, let's see what I did here. Though this is my uh, free BSD machine, which we don't need here. So um, let's make this for now about equal. We're gonna get to the printout later. Um, so virtual, once you got it from GitHub, as, uh, of course, um, you just uh, say clone, and, uh, and then you would say something like uh, git clone, like so, right? And so I just already did that. And once you download, you have all this stuff. And um, one library that you may need, which is not default anymore, by Ubuntu is libcurses, 
leap and curses. So you do something like sudo apt install lib and curses asterisk something like that, and it will go install the and curses library, which uh, which this project needs to be able to build. And then you just say I don't remember if it's configure yeah configure and then make, and it is able to compile most of the stuff. There is some stuff it's not able to compile, and I haven't looked into that yet. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know what this data is. Um, looks like there's a library missing uh, something, but uh, not a biggie to get it to um, compile at all. But uh, once you have this done, even down to this step, I, I will at some point resolve this, but it's not important for this video. You go to the subdirectory, and you have the Yul uh, assembler for the Apollo guidance computer. Now Yul, I think, stood for Yul Tilde. I, I think it was some reference to December 1959 or something. I don't remember it exactly. It's in Don Isle's book, which I highly recommend. In fact, let me link, let me show it to you here. Uh, Don Isle's book, uh, Sunburst, oh, Sundance. Yeah, uh, that's the book. No, um, I have this book also, which I also recommend, but I think it's this one. Yeah, Sunburst and Luminary by Don Isles. Highly interesting book. I have it both in Kindle and hardcover. Um, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, so get this book, read it. You'll learn a lot. Also the other book I just showed. So uh, there's a guy there called Blair Smith, Hugh Blair Smith, he wrote, he was in charge of the uh, assembler at MIT, which uh, was part of the uh, Polar project, and uh, and Don Isles worked there as well, up in Boston and you know, Cambridge, near Boston. And um, so once you built this, you have the uh, Yule assembler. Okay, now the Yule assembler um, works fine, and as part of the virtual AGC um, directory, you will have all the uh, all the source code of the Apollo guidance computer. You have the version for here, Comanche, Colossus is for the uh, command module uh, where the three astronauts would sit and where Michael Collins was sitting while he was orbiting the moon. Uh, in, and in the meantime, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin for Apollo 11, of course, uh, were descending to the moon. And so this is the software for the command module, which, which it itself is concerned about getting to the moon orbiting the moon correctly, exiting the moon orbit and returning to Earth and then landing. Whereas uh, the uh, the lunar module would have this software called Luminary. Um, so L stands for lo lunar module and C stands for command, command module. And uh, so 099 is the version of the software, Luminary 099 is the one that was in Apollo 11. And uh, Apollo 12 on, had Luminary 210, all the way to the last uh, lunar um, mission, um, Apollo 14, uh, was it Apollo 14 or 17, I don't remember, uh, probably 17. So uh, they used this version. Now, since this is the famous software and this is this year is 50 years since the landing of uh, Man on the Moon, we're gonna look at this software here. So once you go in here, oh, okay. So you have here all the source code, right? Uh, we can take waitlist. Waitlist was the module that was uh, taking care of the short, of the tasks that needed to be repeated uh, regularly, need to be scheduled regularly, and they were short. Um, so you had jobs on, on the, in the Luminary software, you have the, the notion of jobs, which are longer running tasks, because there's an operating system, obviously. It's a very small operating system called the executive that would schedule things and uh, and jobs are are not don't have to do, complete within a set amount of time and so they will be scheduled as jobs and then you have tasks which have to be which typically would come uh, recur uh, often so let's say if you had one of the diskies of that little um, user interface between the astronauts and the software where you punch in on the keyboard. If you had something blinking, then this will go into wait list. It will be a task that will be scheduled, let's say, I don't know, twice a second to blink, unblink, and then you know, turn on the light, turn it off, 
and then wait a little bit and turn it on again. Um, so that would be waitlist. And so here we have the whole code, right? Um, okay, so here's um, where you would schedule uh, a task and then return to the caller after the insertion, okay? So this is have to have to read. It's actually very easy to read. It's complicated to un and understand it all. I don't know if it's possible to understand it all, even, but uh, the parts that that you focus on are easy to understand. Um, and it's well documented. Uh, the following may be in the switch bank. So there were different banks of, so of, of software that you would switch to because of addressability. Um, and those were cord or rope memory, which is kind of copper wires rolled. So that's the interesting thing. So the, the software, the, what we would call ROM software, non-writable software, the, the, the software looking at, was not actually burned into chipsets because those didn't exist yet. It was wires of copper uh, that were woven in, a, in the binary um, pattern to match the, the bits of this compiled software. So the compiled software was actually woven in, in, in copper and uh, in strands, which were called ropes. And then they were folded and, uh, and put into little boxes. And there's another video by a curious Mark, who was recently down in Houston to look at, um, at a guidance computer, which they're trying to fix. And by the way, they also have uh, they they have this recreation of the uh, they have a module that connects and emulates the full AGC. So that's a, a complete emulation, as you can see. That's a disk key, right? And so they're actually in this video here, uh, part ten. They're doing a a landing on the moon, complete landing uh, on the moon, which is uh, program sixty three here. And program 63, by the way, is also, we get to rope memory just back in a second, but uh, let me show you. Uh, P63, well, where is P63? So this is the part that after detaching from the command module in orbit around the moon, first there's a part where it slows down a little bit to get to a lower orbit, and then that's the power descent when the engine, uh, they, they, they start to um, go down. Uh, the IMU is the intricate uh, set of, uh, of um, uh, I call it inertial, the there's a there's a name for that which I don't remember right now. It's the spinning things there. Sorry, I don't remember the words. But uh, and so it uh, this is the power they sent, and there's a lot of uh, things happening. And so 90% of the processing power of the Apollo guidance computer would be taken during this very critical phase, the P63 phase, with uh, measuring ground speed over the moon's ground, measuring distance to the ground. Um, communications with uh, with Houston, um, uh, communication with the astronauts, uh, measuring everything, firing the throttles, and uh, throttling up or down, uh, orientation, all that kind of stuff that used 90% of the of the processing power of the computer, and uh, because of a um, of a of a radar that which was uh, still on. The computer was not able to um, was going over uh, the processing power, and when that happens, the computer would actually just reset, basically restart, and all the the restart happens within microseconds. And since all the software is still there, and the RAM is not erased, it just immediately goes back to where it should be. So nothing is lost, and it would restart in microseconds. I think in two microseconds, it would be able to re to restart the whole computer. Imagine that. Um, but uh, so this is the descent, the critical phase, it's all here, which is what was mostly written by Don Isles. So back again 
to the rope memory. Uh, curious mark, ABC. So. A lot of advertisement on YouTube nowadays. Um, skip ads. So, this is the owner of a real uh, IBM guidance computer. I think of 10, of, uh, of Apollo 10. And uh, here is the people who are... So this is would be a module on the, of the guidance computer, one of the parts of it, and the rope memory I don't know if you get to see the rope memory here. Um, by the way, this is wood, plywood. Um, somewhere here, <clears throat> uh, Apollo rope memory. I want to show it too, but at this point, yeah, here it is. So this is the rope memory. Okay, this is how it's being built. And then this is the, what you saw in the background was one Apollo guidance computer unit, which cost at the time $240,000 each, which is now, I would say maybe two, $3 million each in today's money, maybe more. Uh, this is the ladies who were spinning, who were waving the uh, rope memory, according to the patterns that they were produced by the assembler. <laughs> you know, this is not just RAM, this is the actual ROM, so the software is woven into, into those patterns. And you get one of this a little holds wrong, the software won't work. Okay, you have to have an appreciation. I mean, I have an appreciation for this. It's just amazing uh, what they were able to do. So this videos I explain all that. So um, here's the software, right? And um, and we have the assembler. Oops. And how do we assemble all that? So once we have the assembler defined. Uh, I have it in my uh, path now, okay, so I just can invoke it like that. You have to make sure you put the the assembler itself, the binder of the assembler itself somewhere where you can, it's either in your path. I think what I did is, yeah, I put it in slash bin, probably not, uh, not high security, but that's what I did, just because I'm sometimes a bit lazy. And then um, the way the assembler works is that the, the first module, uh, source code module, where is it? Oh, can we turn off the sound here? Sorry. This is going to be frustrating for all of you. Um, terminal bell, turn it off. Okay. Um, yeah. So here it is. So this, um, starting from main, uh, the way the assembly works is it will call all other uh, source code uh, module so you only need to reference this one and so if you do uh, ya yule main uh, and put it into main listing one right uh, there's only one warning for readable assignments may overflow memory bank but uh, that's not Al's problem not our problem okay so now we have it here now uh, that's okay and it compiled it's very fast obviously back in those days i read in the book somewhere it would take um i think about uh two hours to compile the whole source code on the on the honeywell 1800 mainframe i don't know how long it took on the ibm s360 uh, so let's go here for the actual objects yeah here we start with the actual um, this is the position in the memory and this is the instructions right so um, everything had to fit of course within 15 bit which means 15 bit they had three bits for the um, for the opcode and then the rest was a um, memory address uh, with three with three bits opcode you only get eight uh, opcodes so um, so they had to resort to some other tricks to get to I think about if I'm not mistaken, about 44 instructions in total. Um, and I'm going to go into that here, how they did all that. But yeah, um, and here is the um, here is the whole program in by in in uh, the listing of the of the um, of the binary, and the binary then restored here. Main AGC bin. That's the output from 
from this compilation. Now, one thing I don't like about this is that the the assembler is actually prepared to um, is is meant to create uh, HTML pages, so you can load them out directly in a uh, in a um, yeah in a browser, right? So we can go there and uh, call it virtual. Oops. So if you go there and then go to Luminary 99, uh, yeah, Luminary 99, here it is. Now we should somehow find a less modified. So do it like this. We should have, here it is. Main listing. Where is the HTML? Here it is. Okay, so it's this. It it com it assembles it ready for a uh, browser, but this is no good for my printing purposes because I want to print it in. Uh, I want to create a listing that looks like Donal's output, right? And so uh, while this is useful for browsing the code, because you can link to in the symbol table and see where the symbols are being used, right? This tells you where all the symbols are being used. And so you can press and stuff. Um, and you will find, so it makes it easy to cross-reference the output, but it's not good for printing. And there is an option uh, when you produce the output, so when you produce the listing, you can say, I don't remember what it's called, uh, unpound page. So to remove, so HTML makes it in HTML and uh, um, if you do the unpound, you remove some HTML, not all of it, but uh, so we can do your you unpound page main into main AGC listing two. Okay, so now how do we get this into 1403? So, first of all, obviously, I think this is kind of ugly. Uh, this part and this part because there was no URL links back in the 60s and the pass is fine and that the, the, the assembler has to do several passes up to sometimes 10 passes because in the uh, assembler notation of the IP, uh, Apple guidance computer uh, sorry Apollo guidance computer it's the second time this happens to me I'm sorry uh, forward references were allowed so therefore you have to do several passes that can resolve until you can resolve all the forward references but uh, that's how I would store it. And now from here, we'll see how to get this into a nice looking output, okay? So let's make this a little bit smaller. Now we need a lot of space here because I have huge command lines. So I, I copied this here to this directory called Luminary and uh, this thing here, right? Um, and how do we make this into nice looking PDFs? Um, we're on luminary. Where is okay? So why don't we put this here? So we can just click um, like this. So since we have the fourteen oh three font installed, we can invoke and I've had I made a video in the past how to create PDFs from the mainframe and the problem with is in the previous video I've shown how I just upload an ASCII file into the mainframe and then print it from there and collect it with, connected with uh, the Herc print you know, utility and that will by itself create a beautiful output and if I specify 1403 font then everything is nice and dandy. Now that doesn't work in this case for the simple reason that um, 
uh, the longest line in this output is 259 bytes. So the IBM 1403 line printer uh, is only able to print up to 132 characters. So it's 133 long, but the first character is always a control character. Uh, so zero for you know, one is uh, skip a line, etc. Um, so this doesn't print out nicely on if you print it from any mainframe, MVS or ZOS or anything. Uh, so that that doesn't work. And um, next to uh, having a lot of difficulties in in putting on the mainframe so that the whole formatting stays, right? This thing here. We, you know, we cannot have the mainframe do funny stuff with the formatting here because that's the whole beauty of it, right? That, um, this needs to be preserved in this in this way. So as I've shown, you can remove all the tabs here, and I have, right? There's ways to remove all the tabs and replace them with spaces. Uh, but still, the, the mainframe is not able to print such uh, long lines of 259 characters. So because of that, I use Enscript. Now, Enscript is part of the, I think, GoScript um, package. And so what I do is I tell it to, um, well, let me see, B minus B means not print uh, the headers on the pages. I specify the font that we installed. Um, I don't remember all of this, but uh, uh, here I make green bars or uh, bars on the paper. There are three lines thick. And then the margins, and uh, specify 12 on the side, on each side, and then 40 up and above, uh, b uh, below and above. And this is the file. And then we put it through P PS2 PDF, and something like that. So it's doing it. It's it's 1,280 lines, I think. So it's quite thick. Yeah. So you can see here now. This produces a beautiful print. So we have the frame around it, which we can also remove. And we'll look at it how to remove it in a second. And as you can see now, this uses the 1403 font. Now it's a little small, and we always have some left, some lines left here below. So that's not that's not very pretty. But we can fix all that. Uh, let's go to 100 percent Yeah, it's a little small, right? So what we do is, let's go with a bigger size font. Let's see how this works. Okay, finish processing. That's better because now it uses the whole box. And at, at uh, at, with the size five, it's still a bit too, a bit too small, I think, for most people. It reduces certainly reduces the amount of pages. I don't know how many pages we got here, but 680 pages. It's still a lot. Um, but then the problem is that 62 lines got warped, which means they didn't fit in the length of a page, which I don't like either. Yeah, we can make the margins a little bit smaller, right? We can do it with 10. Let's see what comes out. Then it shouldn't warp any lines or wrap any lines. Sorry, not warp, wrap any lines. And it still does. Um, let's try it with nine. I plan to uh, to produce a couple of hundred bound books of the compiled uh, Apollo 11 lunar landing software. So in PDF with green bar, print it out nicely, just like you saw with 1403 print, have it uh, bound together uh, each in a book and, uh, and sell them at cost. Uh, it's gonna come to about, I think about, uh, it's not cheap, four or $500. So I, I know not that many takers, so that's why I only make 10 or 15 or maybe 20 of those. I have a couple of friends I want to gift them to, one each, and then uh, and then keep them for posterity. So let's see how this looks. Uh, that's no good either. Um, 
that is just too small. So we can try with six, but then more lines will be wrapped around. Let's see how it looks with six. Okay. Yeah, you start to see artifacts like this. Hey, this is a wraparound from this line. It looks bad. So we can go with two, yeah, a lot of lines were wrapped around, 1900 lines. So I think five is the font to go with. Now we can try to eliminate the, um, the border if you don't like that, right? And script. Uh, man and script. The documentation for script is terrible, I have to say. Terrible. Um, script font. So, yeah, as I said, be no header. job header there's somewhere here landscape minus ours landscape So yeah, there's a lot of fiddling. There's a lot of options here. And um, I spent a lot of time looking at this stuff. I don't remember it all, it's so arcane. So I think um, if we remove, was one here. We can try to do it at, comes out there's a way to eliminate the frames uh, I don't remember so you can choose if you want to make them two lines thick the gray, the bars or three still have to find out how to make them green there's a way to make them green but um, that's minor uh, we can also make them blue or red I think uh, but this looks I think this looks good. Uh, I like the way this looks. Um, we can try to make this a little bit less as well. I hope this is not boring to you because uh, we're producing beautiful output. If you're not interested in that, then I would suggest you skip the video. Um, some people... I've become... Oh, okay. So that's nice. So now we have far fewer lines wrapped. So why don't we run this again with 20 or 15, 15, and then maybe we can go with six. Let's try that. So um, some people are obsessed with uh, producing nice output. And in recent years, I've become much more uh, involved with fonts and how things look. Yeah, uh, six is just too big. A lot of lines wrapped around. So I have to go with five. and then maybe we can go here 10 something like that so using font size 5 8 lines were wrapped perfect yeah I think this looks good so something like that is what I'm going to take to the printer have it printed out um, bound into books and uh, as I said, maybe tops of 20. Unfortunately, the page, the cost per page is around uh, 70 cents. Um, and I haven't found a cheaper printer yet for color printing. Uh, black and white is going to be cheaper. And uh, binding is another $30 or so per book. Um, so it's the cost per page really that makes it uh, expensive. And I also want uh, uh, two sides per page. So, um, But this is something like that I think is what I'm going to 
maybe make it um, 15 and it's almost like a square uh, that's what I wanted to do um, I think I'll make also this output available for download uh, so this is the listing assembly listing uh, somewhere I'll find out where and uh, I'll put I'll, I'll point it in the description below this video and um, and I hope you're gonna have fun reading this because uh, this is historic folks I mean this is software that was able um, 200 I think 80,000 miles from Earth to land people on the moon repeatedly without failure right uh, this is major stuff it's amazing and uh, and it's all here documented forever and people uh, with loving care restored the, the source code from old prints and to the point where it all compiles I mean, imagine that we're still able to compile it today in 2019 uh, in June 2019 just uh, a month short of 50 years uh, since this uh, flew on a mission uh, with people and um, so for me this is just amazing I'm so proud as I said in previously the proud as a human proud as an engineer and proud as an American of what we have accomplished here so I hope you have fun watching this uh, please give me all your comments. I know a lot of people will have I will say that I'm taking it maybe a little bit too far, but uh, <coughs> That's okay uh, Please let me know what you think in the comments below this video if you like this particular video press on the thumbs up button Thank you for watching and goodbye